Ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, the ambassadors of uh, Israel, of Switzerland, the Netherlands, um, I should like to welcome you all to the Holocaust Memorial Lecture. My name is Alan Kramer. I'm professor in the Department of History here in Trinity College with our partners, the uh, um, Herzog Center for uh, Near and Middle Eastern Studies in Trinity College and the Holocaust Education Trust Ireland. We have held the Holocaust Memorial Lecture every year since 2006 with some very distinguished speakers. This year our distinguished guest speaker is Professor Raphael Gross. And before I introduce him, let me outline the uh, schedule. Uh, Professor Gross will speak for about 45 minutes, after which we'll have some time for questions. And at the end, Peter Castles, the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Holocaust Education Trust, will give the vote of thanks. Raphael Gross um, <coughs> studied in Zürich, Berlin, Bielefeld and Cambridge and wrote his PhD at Essen University. He was research fellow at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and the Hamburg Institute of Social Research. He has taught at the universities of Bochum and Frankfurt and for 15 years at Sussex University. During his time in England, he was a director, he was the director of the Leo Beck Institute in London and for much of that period, he was also director of the Jewish Museum in Frankfurt. Currently, he holds the chair in Jewish history at Leipzig University. In November, just a couple of months ago, precisely at the time when we were um, corresponding about the invitation to come to speak in Dublin, um, the uh, announcement came that Professor Gross has been appointed as director of the German Historical Museum in Berlin, something that made front page news in Germany's newspaper, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. He has published many books and articles, notably on Karl Schmidt and the Jews, the Jewish question, the Holocaust, and German legal theory. He's published on the November pogrom, 1938, otherwise known as Kristallnacht, on the moral history of the Nazis, and uh, among other things, a document collection on the Auschwitz trial, just to name a few of his long list of publications. Perhaps because he is a citizen of Switzerland, Raphael Gross has been able to approach German and Jewish history from a fresh perspective, enabling him to make free and independent judgments. His current research, is a project to publish a new critical edition of Anne Frank's diary. The diary of Anne Frank, a girl living in an invaded neutral country, is known, of course, all over the world. Most of us here probably read it when we were children, and possibly our first encounter with the history of the Holocaust. This project will include a new translation and an exploration of the history of uh, Anne Frank, Anne Frank, within the framework of comparative European and indeed global history. We're very privileged to have such a celebrated expert to speak on this topic. Please give a very warm welcome to Raphael Gross. Ladies and gentlemen, um, many thanks, Alan, for your warm uh, and friendly uh, introduction. And uh, it's interesting when we met before, the organizers uh, who I will, will also thank for uh, taking the time and energy to organize such an event. Uh, we were discussing, in the end, quite heatedly, how to greet the audience. And I'm not saying what the discussions were about, but I thought it's interesting that such an event even has the potential <laughs> that five people who haven't met before uh, are starting really a moral discussion about questions of justice in light of what happened today. And uh, in a way, you know, even if we are not now discussing what the outcome were and the lines were, I think it's, it's, it shows that it's, it makes sense to have uh, such a, 
in, in kind of evening, and I'm very grateful for all the organizers and everyone in the audience. Um, I will focus very much on one aspect of the diaries of Anne Frank, but of course in the discussion we can talk uh, about Anne Frank from Japan to Israel, from uh, the US to you name it, um, because there are so many different aspects that one can cover. And I also feel like um, adding one more word before I really start my talk, that in the light of the discussion uh, that we, we are all in now, everyone switches on his mobile in the morning and gets new, uh, often depressing news, um, and also the discussion specifically how to address Holocaust Memorial Days in the States, uh, that I'm sure you've all also followed, um, somehow one of the themes in my talk is very much about um, is it a particular Jewish event and how is it commemorated or is it a universal uh, catastrophe so I hope even if I don't address any recent politics which uh, as a historian is not my field uh, would I'm going to uh, deliver has some resonance to what I hope is still relevant for today. For early post-war West German society, the published diary of Anne Frank represented a first limited encounter with what in the 80s finally became known as the Holocaust. Oh, we have a bad interference. This the systematic persecution and murder of European Jewry, a kind of urtext in what would be an evolving effort to come to terms with the event, an effort with different key moments and phases. It is the case that with the Nuremberg trials, already between November and April 1949, the victorious Allied powers had used the press to convene the Nazi mass crimes to West Germany's public. This was a deliberate pedagogic process. Nevertheless, the Germans generally paid little attention to the legal proceedings in Nuremberg and the Allies had no interest in placing the fate of Europe's Jews at their center. This attitude was reflected in legal terminology of the time in the choice. After many discussions about how to designate the statutory offense of the mass murder of the Jews in various phases of the legal proceedings of the term crimes against humanity, formulated by Herr Schlauterbach, rather than the equally new legal term genocide, formulated by Raphael Lemkin, which was in a certain way even maybe more precise. Among the Allies, there was still enormous resistance to any real focus on the details of European jury's destruction. The prosecutors were careful to have as few Jewish witnesses as possible furnish testimony in court. It is thus not very surprising that no early emblematic description of the unprecedented crime committed against European Jewry was offered at Nuremberg. Where for the Allies focusing on the Holocaust was controversial, especially since none of the societies represented by the different Nuremberg prosecutors had a strong interest to confronting the theme head on, for Germany, following a collapse of the Third Reich, experienced by most Germans as a bitter defeat, taking on the theme was extremely improbable. The lacuna in conscious awareness endured for a considerable time. 
There were, of course, accounts and images, in, images referring to the horror of the concentration camps and death camps. But these tended to generate disgust rather than either some initial grappling with what had taken place or feelings of empathy for the Jewish victims. For this reason, the question of why a specific diary and a specific image of a young woman could fill the lacuna, why Anne Frank, through her diary and both its theatrical and cinematic renditions, became a visual and emotional anchor in West Germany's confrontation with the reality of the Holocaust, is of considerable historiographical importance. To an extent, the diary success in West Germany and the image of Anne Frank that began to circulate there had a similar source as the book's reception in many other countries and the USA, Great Britain and France in particular. At the same time, the situation prevalent in the society from which the Holocaust stemmed and which was populated by countless perpetrators and their families was obviously different. For one thing, the resistance to starting to take on the truth was on a categorically deeper level. In that light, the single unmistakable factor in the end rendering Anne Frank's diary into a consensus-generating text in West Germany was as follows. Anne stemmed from a prosperously middle-class Jewish Frankfurt family, not at all very different from many other non-Jewish Frankfurt families. The Franks manifested few signs of Jewish religiosity or ritual practice and related themselves are, related them are scarcely present in the diary. Involved here then was not catalyzing absent empathy for the other, but rather inviting it for a thoroughly familiar young girl. Stated simply, readers could far more easily place themselves in her situation than in that of, say, a girl from a secular Jewish Warsaw <coughs> household, alone from a pious Jewish family in a Russian shtetl. One protagonist with a strong influence on the diary's reception history was Otto Frank, on his father. This influence was due to his having taken what were in fact two versions of the diary, an original version and a second one containing additions and omissions that Anne prepared afterwards for the sake of possible post-war documentation and fashioning them into a single text that would be published first in Dutch, then in many other languages, including German. But to fully understand Otto Frank's influence and intentions in respect to his daughter's diary, we need to consider the role through which he distinguished himself in post-war West German society. The nearly impossible role of an Auschwitz survivor actively struggling to see to it that non-Jewish Germans understood the European Jewish faith. In this way, from a historical perspective, we can understand Otto Frank as one of a group of German Jewish public persons who were either active in post-war Germany in various intellectual and juridical fields as remigrants or established close contact from abroad with German colleagues. Otto Frank was, to be sure, not the major intellectual figure, but through his work to realize a broad circulation and an awareness of his daughter's diary, his role in catalyzing public confrontation in West Germany with the deliberate destruction of European Jewry was equal to and perhaps greater than that of more famous German Jewish contemporaries. Frank Peer, the sole member of his family to survive the Holocaust, following the discovery of the family's warehouse hiding place 
in Amsterdam's Prinzengracht and abduction by the Gestapo, his wife Edith was starved to death in Auschwitz, his two daughters Anne and Margot murdered through typhus in Bergen-Belsen. After Auschwitz liberation by the Red Army in January 45, Otto underwent an odyssey returning to Amsterdam on 3rd June, learning of his wife's murder during the trip. On 18th July, he was informed of the murder of his daughters thanks to a Red Cross list. Otto Frank received Anne's written diaries from Mip Gies, his, er her, his earlier office employee, shortly after returning to Amsterdam in the summer of 1945. Together with other helpers, Gies had cared for and supported the family in its hiding place. She gained possession of the documents as follows. On 4th August 1944, in his arrest action in the warehouse, Gestapo official Karl Silberhauer examined a file folder in the process tossing the diary books onto the ground. After the Green Police had withdrawn from the scene with the abducted family, Gies collected this material, handing it over to Otto after hearing of Anne's death. In November 45, after having brought the two diary versions together into a single text and preparing a typescript, he asked Anneliese Schütz, a journalist who had emigrated from Berlin to Amsterdam and had known the, both Anne and Margot, to prepare a translation for his mother. But initially, no publisher could be found either in the Netherlands or in Germany, both the Corridor Verlag and the famous German-Jewish Gottfried Beermann Fischer turned the manuscript down. Eventually, however, an agreement was reached with the Dutch Uigerifi Contact Verlag. This, after Jan Romain, a popular Dutch historian, published a path-breaking article about the diary in Het Parol newspaper on 3rd April 1946, presenting it as an important humanistic document. On 25th June 47, sales began of the first 1,500 copies of Het Achterhuis. The title was actually Honest, chosen for her planned novel. It is quite clear from the above that financial motives played little if any role in Otto Frank's efforts to see the diary published. At the time, Otto could, in fact, by no means assume any sort of widespread sales success with the volume, but from manifestly idealistic motives, he did push for its widest possible distribution, so that once on a story had clearly begun to take on explosive popularity, he entered into compromises with publishers. Broadway theatre directors at the Hollywood film industry in ways whose implication he would not have clearly seen. As the popular success of the Diary of Anne Frank continued to increase, Otto's influence on the approach taken to his daughter's memory waned. The role of Otto Frank, of Otto Frank in the popularizing of his daughter's diary was thus a complex one. To gain a greater sense of his own understanding of this role and its purpose, it is useful to consider the German-Jewish context that stemmed his self-identity in a basic way, both before he was driven into exile and after. On his father was born on 12 May 1889 into a family that had lived in Frankfurt for a long time. He grew up in circumstances typically for the cultivated German-Jewish bourgeoisie, the Bildungsbürgertum, as perhaps described most succinctly in George Moss's classic German Jews Beyond Judaism. His parents, Alice and Michael Frank, did not give their children biblical second names, a common practice for more traditional German Jews. Rather, Otto's second name was Heinrich, the fact that he would not undergo the bar mitzvah ceremony points to the insignificant role religion, tradition, religious tradition and practice played for the Frank family. But it is also the case that the Franks did not convert to 
Protestantism or to Catholicism. The importance of affiliation with German culture was unquestioned. But this did not mean such conversion. If there was any conversion in play here, it was to the German ideal of Bildung or humanistic self-cultivation. The striving for Bildung, the comprehensive development of the personality and an emphasis on the person's autonomy and independence, a steadfast awareness of duty combined with a specific bourgeois ethos of work and accomplishment, close and emotional family relations together with highly active participation in public life, these things did not distinguish the Frank banking family from other established families, such as the Bateman's and the Metzler's. The values were held high by both Jewish and non-Jewish families. Like his siblings, Otto received writing and music lessons, and his parents regularly took all the children to the opera. The Franks first lived in a classic villa on the banks of the Main. Then, in 1902, after Otto's father, Michael Frank, founded his own banking house, they moved into larger quarters in Frankfurt's West End neighborhood with artfully laid out garden and appropriate service personnel. Following graduation from the humanistically oriented Lessing Gymnasium in 1908, Otto began studying economics at the University of Heidelberg. He left the university after three years in order to follow his friend Nathan Strauss, Jr., onto a more practical path, that of the New York department store of Strauss' father. But we are informed, as a businessman, he continued to read his favorite authors, Goethe and Schiller. It is important to note in this context that during the Great War, from the middle of 1915 until its end in 1918, Otto Frank fought as a soldier on the Western Front. He fought for the Germany he loved and whose perceived values he deeply believed in, itself nothing unusual for a German Jew of his generation. As a soldier, he was clearly himself not immune to nationalist propaganda. At Christmas in 1916, he thus writes his family from the front as follows, I quote, it can't last long now, even if all the ministers of the Entente keep on shooting their mouths off. Nevertheless, Otto's letters from the Great War reveal a tolerant and moderate personality, a trust in reason, a belief in a better future. In themselves, these biographical details mainly serve to confirm, in a nearly stereotypical way, the basis pattern for mores and values focused on by George Mosse and other historians in their analysis of German Jewry. What arguably is of special interest for our understanding of the way Otto Frank would grapple with his daughter's fate and with it in the fate of her diary is not that in the face of all disappointment with the Germany he had both loved and fought for as a military officer, or put otherwise, despite his experience of prosecution hiding from official German murderers in an Amsterdam antique. Deportation to Auschwitz, the murder of his family, he would always retain his ideals of humanistic education and self-cultivation. Many, also certainly not all, German Jewish survivors did retain these ideals to one degree or another, even with, while, for example, abandoning or indeed vehemently rejecting the old passionate faith in a fusion of Jewishness and Germanness that had been maintained so passionately by the philosopher Hermann Cohen and many others, or becoming Zionists, or internalizing a sense of Jewish religious identity where before there had been virtually none. Rather, what is of special interest is the particular form these retained secular humanistic ideals took for Otto Frank, a core sense 
of the supreme value of the acting subject's autonomous responsibility. A subject who ideally will be directed towards rational action through Bildung in an enlightened environment. To be sure, such maxims corresponded again to the values pervasive among the 19th and early 20th century German Jewish bourgeoisie that ultimately political sensibility and concomitant values clearly informed Otto Frank's interest after 45 in what Germans, especially young Germans, knew and thought. And it clearly informed his awareness of how much Germany had changed in the Nazi period. At the same time, in a perhaps more complex manner, it certainly also informed a lucid strength of will on the part of Anne Frank's father, revealed in the fact that in the post-war period, his stated relationship with religious Judaism remained much as before. A few of his own words were seemingly much to the point. I cite, I see how much help religion can give, but it's not for me. In the same way, looking backward, in a never published interview with an American journalist, Arthur Unger, he described himself as more Jewish minded, but not religious minded. There is a difference. End of course. Against the backdrop of this cursory overview of Otto Frank's basic Weltanschauung and set of values, let us now turn back to the German publication of Anne Frank's diary. In preparing the German edition, Otto Frank and Anneliese Schütz made scattered changes to the diary's manuscript, where they had a feeling a direct translation did not get at the heart of what Anne meant, or else might cause significant offense among German readers. This latter point is central, because it points to the importance attached to the book's publication in Germany. Schütz was of the opinion that, quote, a book we wish to sell in Germany can not contain any en angry anti-German words, end of quote. Otto Frank shared this sentiment, which was by no means self-evident. Most Auschwitz survivors, I guess, would have cared less if post-war West Germans were offended by criticism of Germans. In the 1978 interview with Unger, Otto explained his reasoning as follows. I quote, we, he means him and his wife Fritzi, his second wife, always say, Anne's diary is a testament for me. I must work in accordance with her sense. So I must go about it thinking how Anne would have done it. Probably, if she had finished it, I would have sent it to a publisher as it was. Anne writes about the Germans, what terrible people the Germans were. And I changed this to these Germans, because there were other Germans too. And I'm sure I thought of discussing this with Anne. It is a matter of character, a matter of responsibility, which I feel." End of quote. Later in the interview, Otto Frank clarified what he meant by testament as a text aimed at working, I quote, for peace and understanding, so that the diary does some good. The change in the text being referred to was to Honest Diary entry of 9 October 42. I quote, and besides, there is no greater enmity than that between Germans and Jews, amended by Frank and Schütz into, and there is no greater enmity in the world as that between these Germans and the Jews. But already in 1959, having taken legal action against Lothar Stilau, a radical right-wing secondary school teacher and former Nazi party member who had published a paper claiming the diary was a forgery, Frank testified that these Germans was closer to what Anne wished to express because, I quote, despite the great hardship in which she found herself through the persecution of the Jews and which she already perceived despite her youthful age, 
she decidedly did not toss all Germans in the same pot. For at that time, we also had, and she knew this, many good friends among the Germans. End of quote. In this way, Otto Frank insisted on distinguishing between German Nazis and a putative other Germany. Against considerable opposition in the Netherlands, he does so it so to it that in, that in the exhibition at the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam, and I cite, not only my daughter and the suffering of the Jewish people is commemorated, but also the German resistance in the Third Reich. End of quote. This balancing off of German crimes against an image of German resistance, from our perspective hardly comprehensible in the context of that period, thoroughly corresponded to the self-perception of many Germans in the post-war years, albeit their motives were not necessarily the same as Frank's. The distinction allowed, of course, a separation between, on the one hand, Hitler and the Nazi leadership ranks, the SS, the Gestapo, and on the other hand, normal Germans who, the fiction went, for the most part, had had nothing to do with the Nazi mass crimes. Many people perceived themselves as victims of Nazi policies and the war, or else placed their losses and deprivations on the same level as that of survivors of the racial persecution. Such a perspective on the part of a non-Jewish German Certainly, that the whiff of self expectation about it, indeed of historical falsification. But in the reflection of an intellectual effective structure, not lacking in a degree of historical irony, for a survivor aligned with the German Jewish tradition such as Otto Frank, the perspective would have presented a continuation of the four described pre-war hopes and ideals. Entry into a bourgeois German culture placed fully under a positive sign, that of values now ascribed after the war and the mass murder to the putatively normal German. To be sure, neither surviving Jews from other countries nor the majority of surviving Jews from Germany by any means shared this perspective expressed pointedly in the not insignificant adaptions Otto Frank made to his daughter's diary. They are, in any event, the expression of a very specific position, emerging from a certain experimental horizon formed by a German Jewish Great War veteran and Auschwitz survivor. The position is of crucial importance for understanding reception of the diary. In its book, and stage version within post-war West German society. Following the opening of the stage version in Germany in 1957, six, we, uh, we thus find, to give you an example, Norbert Mullen reporting that, I quote, many in the audience were so moved after the performance that they felt reminded of their own fate. We are also We've also lost so much, end of quote. But also with the advantage of hindsight, we can understand the nature of an effective connections between, emerging here between Otto Frank and the diary's German audience. The fact is that either with or without his small emendations, later offering excuse to call the text authenticity into question, its overwhelming success was at the time by no means predictable. Lambert Schneider, the book's first German publisher, himself offered Frank no prospect of making a profit from sales. Looking back in 1965, Schneider wrote as follows, and I quote, in 1949, Otto Frank broke me the manuscript of the diary of Anne Frank. He told me about the fate of his daughter and of his family and left me the manuscript. Through its truthfulness, the diary of a young Jewish girl became an international success that was likely unprecedented. But this only happened some years later when the paperback edition came out. 
1950, the time was not yet ripe for such a document. End of quote. Nevertheless, the first German edition of the diary did appear in 1950, published by Lambert Schneider Verlag in Heidelberg in Annelies Schütz' Flood translation. The first printing was 4,500. Schneider's assessment was, in fact, only partly correct. On his diary, in the sometimes amended version of her father, hence free of reproaches against the Germans, as opposed to Germans, both treated everyday life in hiding and conveyed sometimes very moving adolescence reflections about life in general. It broke off at the approximate moment of the young girl's arrest for deportation to Auschwitz, thus conveying the story of a highly appealing Jewish teenager without the cruelty of the perpetrators and their atrocities having any place in the book. Just as importantly, the diary of Anne Frank presented a Jewish girl who in no way corresponded to the anti-Semitic image of the Jew conveyed in propaganda from the Nazi period. Non-Jewish person, both young people and adults, could thus identify with Anne Frau for Anne without any problem. The German Jewish background of the Frank family was important for the same basic reason. Despite Anne having been above all socialized in the Netherlands, in line with what is reflected in the above cited remark of Norbert Mühlen, the diary's professional dramatization by Francis Goodrich and Albert Hackett staged in West Germany starting in October 56, and the following Hollywood version film by famous director George Stevens prepared the way worldwide, but particularly in West Germany, for a conciliatory and universalistic focused reception of Anne Frank's text. The paperback edition of Anne's Diaries, first published with Fischer in 1955 and still in print today, included a foreword by Albrecht Goes, one of the most prominent authors in the so-called inner emigration of Germany's Third Reich years. For Goers, the child's diary, as he calls it, offered the truth, nothing but the truth, the entire truth. It reminded readers that the world had not ceased to be a world of barbed wire and concentration camps. This a reflection of Goers' co-option of the Jewish experience to the, of the final solution for an equation of Nazism with Soviet communism, widespread in West Germany at the time of the onset of the Cold War. At the same time, the Fischer Verlag edition furnished reception instructions for the text on its front jacket in the form of a citation from the diary also encapsulating the underlying orientation of its stage and film version. Quote, in spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart. And with strong historical insight, Nicholas Berg comments that the positive, future-oriented avowal by a young girl was precisely what was needed to close the gap between channel moral avowal and the specific desire not to know. But quite possibly, the avowal and diary in general served for more than this. The text was, after all, open for reading and discussion that inspired both people who wanted to know more, or already knew, and those for whom a form of empathy in the sense of identification with the victims represented a need. And precisely this openness appears to have made possible the book's broad reception. If the sole reception dynamic at play here had been one gravitating toward non-knowledge, sophisticated public figures such as Eugen Kogon, past-breaking historian of the SS state, and Fritz Bauer, chief organizers of the organizer of the Auschwitz trial in Frankfurt, would not have engaged themselves on behalf of both the book and Anne Frank's memory. More later on. Otto Frank's belief, after all that happened, 
that changed was possible was a belief in the fact shared with intellectuals such as the name Eugen Kogon or Fritz Bauer or Max Horkheimer. Without such belief, they could not engage in a highly self-aware way in what the philosopher Margaret Urban Walker has described as moral repair. A response emerging in the wake of grave ethical and legal injury. But on the side of many of the diary's readers and of the play's viewers, this repair effort, and here Berg has been pointed the way, was countered by a form of universalism that in effect blocked out the deliberate mass murder of the Jews, or perhaps more precisely, circumvented it by focusing on belief that, I quote again, the people are really good at heart, but entirely without the in spite of everything, pointing to the, to the horrific backdrop. In other words, it would appear that the universalism on his father found articulated in his daughter's diary and even intensified was not identical to the universalism that post-war West German society read into or heard in her words. One thing seems clear precisely for this reason. In the 50s, 60s, 70s, the diary of Anne Frank could never have served as a shared West German reference point if it had not made possible a form of identification tied so weakly with the particular specific Jewish faith that the text offered itself to non-Jewish Germans of virtually every possible shade. The paperback edition of the diary published, as I said, by Fischer was a success from the start. Sales already hit the 40,000 mark in March 55. By January 57, four months following the West German stage premiere, the figure was 200,000. And at the end of 1958, the year before the appearance of the film version, it was 800,000. Corresponding to Otto Frank's wishes, the text's broad dissemination was thus given essential impetus through its dramatization. After the diary's appearance in France in the 50s, sales began in both in the US and in Great Britain in 52. Interestingly, also the English language edition had prominent supporters, even a foreword by Eleonora Roosevelt, sales were slow. One enthusiastic supporter was the novelist Mayor Levine, now best known for compulsion, his fiction account on the notorious Leopold and Loeb murder case. Levine eventually convinced Otto Frank to approve his writing a stage version. But after no producer could be found for the completed play, Frank handed the production rights to Kermit Bloomgarden, who at the end of 1953 commissioned the married couple, Franz Goodrich and Albert Hackett, to come up with a new text. Otto Frank quickly saw that he and Maya Levine had different core assumptions. Already in June 52, he wrote Levine as follows. As to the Jewish issue, you are right, that I do not feel the same way you do. I always said that honest book is not a war book. War is the background. It is not a Jewish book either. So Jewish sphere, sentiment and surrounding is the background. I never wanted a Jew writing an introduction for it. It is at least here read and understood more by Gentiles than in Jewish circles. So do not make a Jewish play of it." End of quote. To interpret this passage in the least complicated way possible, since Otto Frank wished to avoid anything that would stand in the way of broad popularization, the Jewish aspect of his daughter's diary needed to merely represent the background, or else had to be expressed in universal terms. But in actuality, Frank's approach was a bit more complex. While resisting reading the diary as a Jewish book, he preferred a Jewish director for the film. 
Nevertheless, correspondence indicates he was highly pleased then in the end with um, both the film and the play that in the end was actually not uh, being done by a Jewish uh, director. Following um, the West German premiere of the play in October 56, a regular on a front cult emerged in the country with thousands of young people making pilgrimages, the term began to be used in the press, to Bergen-Belsen and laying down flowers for Anne at an anonymous mass grave. The events would, held, would be held on Anne's birthday on the 12th of June. Pupils from Frankfurt School were invited to a reading from the diary and scenes from the play accompanied by classical music. Eugen Kogon, a Catholic opponent of Hitler who had spent six years in Buchenwald and whose book on the SS state analyzed the system had survived, he had survived, delivered a memorial speech in St. Paul's Church. Anne, he reminded the pupils, would have been 28 years old on that day. Her diary furnished precious information on living on the ground during the Nazi dictatorship. Anna's request to her parents, let me be as I am, then I am happy, and her adherence to ideals to the good in human beings formed the framework for Kogong's remarks. But at their core was a call for political centered entirely on human beings, on their lives, and possessing a European dimension. People from France, Italy, and the Netherlands, he indicated, were not necessarily more clever or more moral than those from Germany. But, as he put it, they had become fed up once and for all with those among them who were incorrigible. Following Kogon's talk, Ernst Deutsch read the parable of the rings, the quintessential universalist German Enlightenment manifesto of religious tolerance, from Lessing's Not on the Wise. The event's conclusion was marked by a ceremonial uncovering of a memorial plaque in Ganghofer Straße 24, the house where the Frank family had lived. The plaque was framed by burning torches and there was singing of the song of the Pete Box soldier. The choice of this song was certainly no coincidence. It had emerged as a response by political prisoners to their suffering in the concentration camps and had nothing to do with the Jewish deportees and their extermination in killing fields and death camps. <coughs> We should note that despite the enthusiastic contribution of words of greetings and commemoration by Frankfurt's administration, its primary concern was holding the costs of the memorial tablet, quote, as low as possible. In any case, they were by no means to exceed 3,000 German marks. That's what I found in their internal correspondence. As mentioned, over the following years, a commemorative event for Anne Frank was held regularly on each 12th of June, the message would remain very much the same. In the 70s, finally, the society that organized it ended the commemorations, then the general interest in Anne among the West German public had clearly waned. Hence, her story received greatest intentions between 1957 and 1970. The 10-year period, that is, during which the first trials for murders committed by the Einsatz mobile killing squads were held in Ulm, the Auschwitz trial in Frankfurt, steered public focus on the Holocaust, and the student movement preoccupied itself with what it termed fascism. But a period during which a certain growing rollback of interest in Nazi crimes also became apparent. Starting in the late 1950s, Anne Frank emerged as the icon of the Jewish catastrophe in Europe. Alongside a popularization through diary, drama and film, there was visual presence that transmitted images of a lovely adolescence girl sitting properly at her desk and tending her diary corresponded to bourgeois ideals actively and positively lived in the Frank family, and that 
were fully compatible with ideals being cultivated in post-war West German society. Abo Knoch has shown that the photographs of Anne continue the tradition of Western European depictions of women, and here I quote, and it had its contemporary correspondence in photographs of the Scholl sisters and portraits of Stauffenberg. The faces were rendered into icons, maintaining a semblance of undestroyed holy bodies, standing alone without the photos of the Baron Belsen corpses. The portrait became a frequently present object of identification and projections. In this way, the confluence of iconic image and positive message of believing in human good made it possible to place Anne in a Christian iconographic context behind which both her specifically Jewish ordeal and the specificity of Nazi Germany's mass crimes disappeared. Around the same time, first through Alan Resnay's documentary of 1956, Night and Folk, then through Gerhard Schönberner's photographic volume of 1960, Der Gelbe Stern, the, the image of a terrified young boy in the Warsaw Ghetto gained prominence. Arms raised, SS and Gestapo men behind him, weapons at the ready, one the sadist Joseph Bloche holding a pointed machine gun, driving a stream of Jewish women and children out of an apartment building's opening. Today, this image is likewise an icon of the Holocaust, but in the 60s, the role of the East European ghettos in the extermination of European Jewry was not common knowledge. In this period, even following and I'm coming to the end. The Frankfurt Auschwitz trials and the beginnings of public acknowledgement of the enormity of what had taken place, the image of Anne Frank, a girl from a German Jewish family, continued to be more compatible with popular West German needs. She now served as the face of an abstract figure, six million European Jews. Then, in the years leading up to the 1979 West German broadcasting of the American TV series Holocaust, the history of the family Weiss, Anne was still serving such an iconic role. But the distinctive term for the mass crime had not yet emerged into popular awareness, reaching millions of West German viewers. The Holocaust series furnished the term. Claude Lanzmann, who would produce his masterful film Shoah in 1958, in 1985, took a critical stance regarding the series. Where Anne Frank served as the face of six million and where Holocaust presented explicit fictive scenes of persecution and extermination to a mass audience on German. TV, Lanzmann maintained the thesis that no image was capable of symbolizing the systematic industrial extermination of European Jewry. But the fact remains that the attempt to convey an idea of the mass murder in the popular TV series opened a pass for Lanzmann to present his controversial thesis in Germany as elsewhere and for his still deeply shocking film's enormous public acclaim. By this point, the role of the diary of Anne Frank had basically shifted, so that the book was increasingly serving, it continues to serve in this role now, as a way for young people throughout the world to gain access to a scene whose horror represents an enduring pedagogic challenge. But Anne Frank's father would only witness an early stage of the process sketched out here. And he would not, in any event, be present at the controversy initiated by Lanzmann's film. Otto Frank died in Birsfelden near Basel on 19 August 1980. The image of his daughter has retained its iconic power. Historically, 
it is perhaps the most widely recognizable image ever produced of a young girl. Thank you very much. Rafael Gross has kindly agreed to take a few questions. We have a roving microphone, um, so please raise your hand if you wish to ask a question. I'm not sure if I understand your question. Can you, can you repeat what I meant by saying that Anne Frank was not religious or, or what? No, I think Anne Frank said, I don't suppose that he believed he was Jewish but not religious, spared the Jacobs. I was wondering what you think he meant by that. Right. I mean, I think, um, especially after the Holocaust, um, for this group of very, as the historian call it, acculturated or assimilated Jews, specifically from Germany, who did not really have any religious uh, affiliation to Judaism, um, but who also did, after the Holocaust, not have any kind of uh, emotional uh, feeling of belonging to Germany after 45, what, what, what was left there? It was left a kind of, um, I would say, kind of uh, an ethnic feeling of belonging to the Jewish uh, people, um, but not in a very religious way. So, he, you know, he felt somehow um, Jewish. He was also engaged in setting up uh, a Jewish community, a liberal Jewish community in Amsterdam, in so he would not really regularly go to the um, um, to the synagogue. So he had a feeling of belonging to uh, being Jewish uh, in an ethnic sense, but at the same time he never felt himself religious. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, have you read when fathers and grandfathers who had been in the camps, who had a certain idea of what they were doing in there, found their own daughters and granddaughters reading this book about a girl that they self-identified with and the effect it had on them. Has there been any work on that in terms of psychological effect that would have had on the perpetrators? Um, not that I would know of. Um, however, that there, I mean, the, your, your question, in a way, is a very interesting one because, in a general way, of course, there is a lot of research looking at how the different generations in Germany, uh, from the bystanders and perpetrators, um, and then later on their children and grandchildren, how, how this um, um, also, in a kind of uh, generational way, transformed. One of the interesting findings that specifically around 2010 or so was discussed open was uh, by a social psychologist uh, with a team of historians who uh, found out that while the second generation, so the children, uh, had big problems with what their parents did, the grandchildren's somehow knew a lot about what happened 
they read Anne Frank and, and they saw the Holocaust, etc. But they did not see it in their own family. So the term was um, uh, grandfather was no Nazi. Opa war kein Nazi. So in the in the own family there was a kind of lacuna. It did not happen with us. But there was a knowledge of the whole picture, and that that I think this has been studied. Um, the other way around that you also ask how did those who were active in it feel is, um, I don't think that uh, this has been looked at, but I think it's a, it's a good question. Thank you. Yes. Well, that every discovered how the primates, and everyone found out how the primates were discovered in the hiding um, Yes. Um, there are many, many um, books about this, um, mainly written by journalists, investigative journalists, who somehow used the big name of Anne to write a bestseller by finding out that they now know who was responsible. Um, the editors now, Martin van Gelden and myself and the team of people who work now again on things, we do not have a conclusive answer who was responsible. They, there are many, many different um, kind of ways. It is um, most likely that so many people were involved in helping them um, getting food, getting on a, on a sh during a time where a lot of people in Amsterdam were starving, so that wasn't so easy. Um, finding, uh, finding people to help getting food, f bringing there, they lived above uh, a working factory, basically. You see also in the diary, in the A and B version, that Anne talks about it more than once, that they were nearly discovered because they made noise and people heard downstairs. So there's so many um, moments where it is possible that, that someone uh, somehow found out something. But also coincidence should not be neglected. So it's, it's a mixture. It can be a network of people that people suddenly start talking, oh, they help, and then there is someone who is an informant to the Gestapo. That's one way. Or it can also be pure coincidence. So the simple answer is, as far as we know, there is no really clear answer. Even so, there are many people who will give you a clear answer. But we, we couldn't uh, find any of them being totally convincing. If I may just add, of course, most Gestapo files were destroyed by the Nazis at the end of the war. Some survived, but obviously not the right Gestapo files survived in the archives. Any further questions? Yes. When did the Frank family move uh, from Frankfurt to Amsterdam? When did they move to Amsterdam? To Amsterdam. Um, <coughs> The family partly already moved out of Frankfurt uh, very early. Part of them already before the rise of the Nazis went to Switzerland. That's where his grandmother, Alice, went with the cousin of Anne Frank who passed away last year, Budi Elias, in this part of the family. They went to, to Basel because they had a, a chance to, to live there. Um, um, Otto was quite early trying to investigate in Holland how to set up a firm there. At the same time, his wife uh, went first uh, to family in Aachen, and only, I think, in '34 then moved on, which still was quite early, um, and gave them somehow quite a long period of their life in uh, Holland that was then still free. So. Um, what I haven't went into this here, uh, um, Anne went to a Montefiore school in Amsterdam and uh, obviously the diary is written in Dutch and it's, uh, it's, it belongs very much to Dutch culture also. I portrayed here really the German Jewish aspect because I very much focused on, on Otto. Uh, but um, this period between uh, after 34 was of course very important, uh, especially for Anne. 
um, but also her sister, so the influence is quite strong. They also tried, this is well known since, uh, since uh, Richard Brightman uh, published those files already a couple of years ago, they tried to go to America, but were not allowed entry to the US. Yes. Um, I hope I understood your questions correct. Um, I mean, I was actually not talking so much about Anne in this talk, but about Otto. Um, I was trying to somehow uh, focus on the father who brought together the two versions of her diary and make it, made it accessible, in his view, to a general German audience by avoiding anything that he felt might offend um, a German reader, a non-Jewish German reader, and uh, by, at the same time, he did not want it, uh, it to be, as he uh, says in, in this letter that I quote, uh, to turn her into a, a Jewish kind of diary. So what I do think plays, plays into this broad reception is that the book could be read in post-war Germany spe specifically uh, by a very wide range of people, from the left to the right, um, from people who because it's, it doesn't say anything about perpetrators. It doesn't say anything about uh, the ideology of, of, of persecution. It says, basically, it's a very apolitical book. It just talks about uh, her belief in positive values. Um, and I do think that uh, might be one of the key reasons why it became such a world bestseller that was translated in maybe over 70 languages um, because it somehow uh, is, is, is a very, um, it's very unspecific in many ways. If it would have been the story of an orthodox Jewish girl who would have studied um, things that for a normal reader of one of those, let's say, 70 cultures that were reading it in 70 different languages were totally unfamiliar, it might have not been such an um, easy read. So I do think that turning it into this kind of universal, um, in a way, apolitical, religious um, young girl did uh, help to make it such a success, yes. Well, um, we've had many questions. I'll take just one more, yes. It's a, um, thank you for your question. I mean, I, I have really left 
all this part out. Many other scholars in our book are dealing exactly with her style, uh, with question of gender, um, uh, specifically the part that we have on Japan uh, takes on a lot of what you say because in Japan she is seen uh, very much as a hero for a young girl um, being open about sexuality. That's uh, you know that it went so far that uh, the period became ane days in Japanese and uh, tampons were called ane because he, she was so identified with uh, an open way to talk about uh, a young woman's sexuality. So, and there is, there is a Anne uh, church uh, in Japan. So th there are many ways to, to look at her in, in very different contexts that are highly interesting. And I'm sure that what you mentioned, uh, that there is the kind of uh, narrative uh, strength in her plays a big role. Having said so, interestingly, if you look at how the book was read by literary scholars, like Harold Bloom, to mention one, or others, they normally do not take her serious. It's rather, they, 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 uh, there, there are many approaches to it, but there's not a lot of kind of serious approach to the text, uh, like you have asked, you know, what's the strength? I mean, maybe one of the strongest, maybe is Philip Roth, uh, who, who deals with it. Yeah, I think he, he takes it in a way as a, as a very serious uh, figure, but uh, there is not so much. It's interesting. Also, in, when we uh, looked at, at the text, there is not uh, no much serious looking at also the, her language skills and so on. Um, what we do look at um, is that there is a very long tradition in the family of Anne Frank, uh, of writing letters, and the diary is in a way letter writing enterprise, there is a huge correspondence within the family, ten thousands of letters that were uh, late discovered in Basel on the, uh, in the Herbst gossip. So uh, she is really part of a, of a, of a tradition um, um, that she falls in and she obviously is very gifted very early in how she writes. She also writes short stories, etc. Et on the sides. It's not just her diary that she writes. She has, she's very ambitious. Um, and all of that, I think, plays in it. On the other hand, it's also interesting because the translations also play a big role. Often, especially, for example, in English and German, the translation portray her in a much I would say, the style of an older woman than she was. The kind of childish uh, um, uh, part of her, she was, when she started really very young still, uh, is kind of taken out of the translations. And so, you know, you will have to look also at how the translations work in different cultures and different contexts. So that makes your question even, even a bigger one. Um, yeah. I, I think at, at that point, um, where quite obviously this discussion could go on to raise more questions about gender, about childhood, about <coughs> young adulthood and literature, literature quality. It raises all these questions about the central European literary culture, which we could go on discussing forever. But I think it is now time uh, to uh, uh, call on Peter Castles to give the vote of thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Alan. As Alan has said, uh, my name is uh, Peter Castles. I'm the chair of the Holocaust Education Trust uh, here in Ireland. And it's so my great uh, privilege to move on all your behalf uh, a vote of thanks uh, to Professor Gross, uh, not just for his lecture here tonight, but also for the work he has done in the whole area of uh, Jewish uh, history uh, and culture. Uh, no more than ever today, of course, as we all know, we need to learn uh, the lessons of the past. And while Professor Gross this evening uh, has brought us and guided us through the past and Anne Frank's diary and that, I think on that need to know basis, he's also identified uh, some lessons for us 
uh, for today. Uh, I mean, at a time of, of uh, Holocaust deniers, and uh, if you haven't seen it, I would recommend to you to go and see the film uh, Denial. It's a very, very good film that's on at the moment. And at a time of the rise in anti-Semitism, with its implications for Jews uh, throughout the world, including in the uh, State of Israel, uh, we've learned from Professor Gross's work, and indeed from the diaries, that the attempt by the Nazis to exterminate the Jews uh, from Europe uh, was not an accident of history. It was a, a conscious policy, it was planned, it was administered uh, with the supports of tens of thousands uh, and the complicity of millions, including the complicity uh, of some people uh, here in Ireland. So I think it is important for us to learn these, uh, a, a lesson like that. Also on the need to know uh, that was uh, mentioned by uh, Professor Gross, there is an urgent need for us to know and to understand uh, the roots, the implications uh, and the ramifications of uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, because again, as we know from tonight and on previous lectures we had, the Holocaust happened uh, because people, uh, groups uh, and governments allowed uh, prejudice hatred and anti-Semitism to flourish. And in allowing it to flourish, then being too late to do or to stop the actual uh, consequences. And the third lesson that I've taken uh, from this evening uh, is the importance of the work that uh, Professor Gross and others are doing, not just in the lecture we've heard, but as I said, the important work around uh, Jewish uh, history and culture and in particular in educating our young people uh, about the dangers of hatred or bigotry, uh, about the importance of accepting and celebrating diversity, uh, and also again the importance for all of us of the need to appreciate and protect uh, democratic uh, institutions and values. So uh, on all of our behalf, in thanking uh, Professor Gross both uh, for the lecture and as I said the uh, great work he's been doing in other areas on these topics I'd like you to show your appreciation in the usual manner.